Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops is an ambitious, albeit clumsy game that doesn't always hit the mark yet still manages to be a mostly entertaining and satisfying entry within the Metal Gear Solid series. Here's why. Before Peace Walker and Phantom Pain, Metal Gear's shift from linear campaign to base building sim all began with this spin-off entry for the PSP. Portable Ops completely shook up the established gameplay model of Metal Gear games past and laid the foundation that later games would streamline with remarkable success. Set in the San Geronimo Peninsula, Portable Ops' missions in contrast to the first three games all take place within completely different levels. There's enough connectivity that the locations still create a cohesive whole, but now there's a healthy amount of variety to each level, both in their aesthetic as well as their often expansive structures. And I've honestly always preferred this approach far more than everything taking place in one setting. This way, you're free to have way more diverse levels to sneak around and blast your way through. And for the stealth action genre, you kind of get the best of all worlds here. From classic tight corridor sneaking with cameras a la Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2, to more open-ended levels we've seen become more of the namestay for the series, and all fairly competently designed. Granted, Peace Walker and Phantom Pain had infinitely better level design from a structural and functional perspective. Both games have more cover spots, environmental hazards, and controls that let you engage with your environments more intuitively. But Portable Ops had a lot more color to its drastically different levels, and the layout often changed the feel of things nicely. Sneaking around big open areas is a very different experience from corridor sneaking. Each level is also complemented by their own level music and housing various enemies. It's an approach that I honestly hope future Metal Gear games go back to, especially now that we know Metal Gear actually does still have a future. Portable Ops was also the first Metal Gear game to actually feature first-person movement. In every prior game, whenever you went into first-person view, you were stationary. But Portable Ops actually lets you move around and aim your gun in first-person view perspective, a feature that carried on with each subsequent game minus Peace Walker, though Peace Walker's streamlining was also to the game's benefit. The simplified controls made it both intuitive and mostly smooth, which made it a lot more fun to play. See, despite being a PSP title, Portable Ops had nearly the same control scheme as Snake Eater on consoles. It's a game with a scaled-back campaign that has scaled-up controls and mechanics. It took everything from Snake Eater, then added first-person movement, recruitment, and base building. And admirable as the concept may be, the execution never feels as smooth to play as the earlier or later games. See, the PSP lacked a second analog stick, so you had to use the arrow keys or the face buttons for controlling the camera. And to sneak around, you had to hold triangle whenever walking. So at any given moment, you're holding a number of buttons all at once just to steer your character in place. And the overly busy control scheme results in a game that feels clunky at best and causes your hands to cramp at worst. See, I hated this game when it came out 17 years ago because playing it felt like giving myself carpal tunnel. On emulator, I just resorted to not using the camera unless I had to or using lock-on to keep my camera straight whenever needed. And the issue is that's archaic and gets in the way of an otherwise solid core gameplay loop. Because if you can get past the busy control schemes, there's a lot of fun to be had here. Stealth plays well enough where getting from A to B through bypassing guards is still satisfying. Laying out traps and ambushing bad guys as opposed to knocking everyone out just feels as enjoyable as ever. I mean, it's still clunky holding triangle to press against walls and move quietly. But if you can get in the groove, it can feel quite good to pull off. Best yet, however, is combat. Snake Eater had excellent combat that felt high-octane and great for run-and-gun action, but Portable Ops was the first Metal Gear game where the action, to me, felt better than the stealth. For as busy as the controls are, the way you can alternate between lock-on aim and precision first-person combat with strafing has a really satisfying feel to it. Like Snake Eater, if you triggered an alert, in most instances it felt manageable and just as fun to blast your way out of as sneaking around did. Like its sequels, Portable Ops also ditched a linear campaign for a pseudo-mission-based approach. I say pseudo because despite the fact that you have to select the missions through the main menu, these aren't missions you can just replay like you could in the later games, much to this game's detriment. It means that if you want to replay certain missions or bosses, your only option is to restart the entire game, unless you're on an emulator. And the base campaign beyond main missions boils down to resource gathering and enemy recruitment, all of which only ever worked in service of the main campaign, not as a core gameplay loop. See, if I'm in a level, I want there to be a specific goal to work towards, not just getting in, scavenging guards and materials and getting out. Though one element I really liked was the way Portable Ops implemented its side missions. Throughout most MGS games and most of Portable Ops' campaign, your objective boils down to reaching a goal. But during a number of side missions, you're given specific tasks. Finding and interrogating officials under heavy guard, where the act of reaching them undetected is both challenging and rewarding, or sabotaging trucks and equipment. They're simple tasks, but I appreciate actually having a hands-on objective to carry out and prefer that over simply reaching a goal and letting cutscenes do the rest. As a matter of fact, Portable Ops really could have benefited from more of this kind of design in its campaign, with more variety to boot. 
like having to assassinate various targets of soldiers, sabotaging more equipment. Nothing extensive, but something to make missions feel less repetitive. And that is, unfortunately, something Portable Ops suffers from immensely, which its predecessors greatly improved upon, the missions themselves. At its core, Portable Ops is a linear MGS game, broken up piece by piece like Peace Walker. Every mission boils down to doing one of two things, reaching a goal or recovering a document. It's simple enough and flows nicely for a one and done ride. Trouble is, to justify the existence of having an army, it needed to justify your surveillance team. As through intel reports within each level you assign personnel to, that campaign missions or rare character recruitment missions are unlocked. And what that boils down to is just waiting for reports that lead to side missions where you recover documents and levels you already beat to unlock the genuinely new missions. It's an all too roundabout way of progressing that just murders the pacing of this game. Speaking of pace killers, let's talk about the biggest selling point of Portable Ops, base building. Before MSF, before Diamond Dogs, and long before Foxhound, there was… Truck. The premise involves Naked Snake building an army to defeat an army. And like the latter base building games, that boils down to knocking out guards and capturing them. You do that by dragging downed enemies to Campbell's truck, or dragging them to a nearby box for allies to extract after a codec call with Roy. The act of recruiting soldiers in this game is, quite frankly, tedious, but Portable Ops tries to make up for that by doing a lot more with the squadron-based gameplay. For starters, weapon and gear acquisition is largely contingent on what the guy you recruited was packing. You can find weapons around at any given level, especially in side missions, but if you want certain gear, merely look at what the bad guys are packing and capture them. On top of that, there's a proto-hitman mechanic throughout this game, where instead of everyone getting matching uniforms, your new soldiers keep their unique looks. So when you play as any one of them, they can run around freely in levels without drawing attention, so long as they don't run into other guard types or sneak. It's a great way to mitigate backtracking and having to repeat the same levels, which you will be doing a lot of. It also incentivizes being smart with your squad, another really interesting element to Portable Ops that sequels never really did anything with. In this game, you aren't a one-man army anymore. You have a whole set of teams you deploy with you whenever you go out on a mission. Usually that involves Snake and various guards if you want to stay undercover and need to use different disguises to get past certain areas. Now, admittedly, I never really went that route because I prefer conventional stealth, but it comes in handy if you're going on a recruitment drive because different soldiers have different skills. Some guys can transfer items straight to the truck since you only have four item slots. Others can drag bodies way quicker than Snake can. It also works to almost act like a life system in the game where if you die, your progress won't be lost because you still have three other soldiers to pick up the slack. The drawback is that minus Biggie, anyone who dies stays dead. It's a very extensive, hands-on system that we never got with Peace Walker or Phantom Pain, but to be honest, that's not a bad thing. So much of Portable Ops' tedium is built around this system. I mean, look at it this way. Who needs recruits that can transfer items when you can just automatically do so by walking up to items when your inventory is full? What good are troops who can drag bodies quicker when Fultons exist? Why bother with squads at all when you're as effective as a one-man army as you are as a team? And that's kind of the larger issue. Squads feel almost gimmicky. I didn't want to run around freely because the whole point of stealth action is sneaking around and adapting when things go south. Its implementation also got in the way of the boss fight since you need rations and life meds. The squadron-based gameplay of Portable Ops was, I feel, to its detriment, creating a series of roundabout progression blockers when just advancing from mission to mission would have been so much more ideal, because having to wait on reports to advance to the next mission by stuffing each level with intel operatives doesn't make for a better campaign. That's a big part of what made Peace Walker and Phantom Pain so much more fun. So much of the squad-based stuff was there, but so streamlined that it never got in the way of the missions. You could mostly just trailblaze on through the campaign in a way you just can't with Portable Ops. See, on its own, Portable Ops will be a rock-solid Metal Gear game. Every one of these missions is perfectly enjoyable as a one-and-done chunk of campaign, especially on replays when you're skipping cutscenes and just sticking to the gameplay. You'd have a simple game that may not do anything new, but does everything well enough that it's a good time to jump back into as you please. But with the exception of the boss fights, there isn't a single part of Portable Ops' campaign that's so fun that I wanted to redo it over and over. So having to constantly redo these same levels over and over just wears me down. I respect the desires to do something new, especially on a portable console, and you don't get an MGS5 without this game. So I can't not be thankful for the foundation Portable Ops laid but so many of my issues with this game were entirely unforced errors. Now granted, that's nothing new with Metal Gear, but its lulls and pacing last so much longer than MGS1 or even MGS2, and it's still enough of a detriment that I don't really find myself eager to replay this game beyond its bosses. And speaking of, let's talk about them, because that's one aspect Portable Ops almost entirely knocks out of the park. 
Portable Ops only has 6 boss fights, two of which are against Null, so like Phantom Pain, it only really has 5 boss types. But what it lacks in quantity, it sorta makes up for in quality. I say sorta because I'm kind of split on Portable Ops' boss fights. Python and both fights against Null are in my opinion some of the best boss fights in the series. Python is a perfect mono e mono showdown. It's just you alone in this sizable two-story corridor with an enemy armed with an assault rifle. It's completely straightforward but made unique by the fact that the whole arena is shrouded in icy mist, obstructing your vision, and the fact that Python can freeze your weapons, rendering you vulnerable unless you can thaw them out with the two heaters in the area. I love the simplicity of this fight because it really works to make the already great combat shine even better. Python's health bar is long enough to get your money's worth out of this fight without it ever feeling like it's dragging on. Another cool thing is that lethal or non-lethal actually results in different cutscenes after you beat Python, where he's either recruited or he goes full Cobra unit and explodes to death. You can even shake Python off and lay into him undetected, but honestly, there's not much point since you can't do extra damage beyond what you could do just shooting head on. Plus, Python always follows one set path when he's in search mode, versus other bosses that have more unpredictable search patterns. But even with just combat, there's so many different ways to face Python, be it direct assault, pot shots, or outright cheesing him with a shotgun. And the end result is a fight that is consistently fun each time I load up that quick save file. And if Python's already great, the Null's fight is downright spectacular. Like Python, it's a one-on-one -on -one showdown against a very powerful enemy in two massive boss arenas with tons of ground to cover. Unlike Python, however, Null's far more mechanically diverse. He's got his Uzi, but get in range and Null has a wide array of different machete attacks. Shoot at Null up front and most times he'll just deflect your shots with his blade. And while you can shake him off, most of the time he's actively zoning in on your current position. And this works for excellent cat and mouse games, where you can catch him off guard when he's hunting you down. And it can get crazy intense for the indoor fighting. Seriously, it's amazing to me that for a series that used to be renowned for its corridor stealth, it was only this one portable spin-off game that actually gave you a corridor-based boss fight. And the end result is insanely fun and so open-ended. Not to mention scary, given you have way less wiggle room in the substation. This fight is MGS action done right, pitting you against an overwhelming foe and letting you use your full toy box to figure out how you want to take them out. Then there's Roxa, the obligatory Metal Gear fight in this Metal Gear game. It's honestly a fairly straightforward, pretty well-designed classic boss fight with two phases. First, you have to destroy Roxa's legs while avoiding his gunfire, which you can do with conventional firearms, rockets, or even using TNT. And you have a pretty wide variety of cover spots to avoid its incoming attacks, but that cover steadily gets chipped away as the fight progresses. And once you ground Roxa, you have to destroy its inner wings, only vulnerable when the shields open up. But it only does that to fire rockets, so you have to have the right balance of offense while outrunning reasonably paced rockets that can deal serious damage, but are slow enough that you can still outrun them. It has just enough attacks to keep things fresh, the damage it does is significant enough to keep you on your toes, you aren't limited to just one weapon, and the mech has as much health as it should to feel like a proper fight that doesn't drag on. Like Python, it's a straightforward fight, but one that does everything well and feels rewarding to overcome. Sadly, I cannot quite say the same about the other mech fight of this game, Lieutenant Cunningham. To me, this is the most disappointing fight in the game, because Cunningham's essentially the ocelot to Gene's liquid. He's a secondary main villain who acts as a persistent thorn in Snake's side, and has his own agenda separate from Gene's. He's his big, tough foe, and how do you fight him? On a tiny platform where he's essentially the ultimate hover guard from MGS3. The goal of the fight is to damage Cunningham's craft enough to de-elevate him so you can gun at him directly. When he's on the offense, you gotta outrun machine gun fire, grenades, rockets, lasers, and avoid mines he tosses. I mean, honestly, Cunningham does have decent attack variety, and the more health or stamina he loses, the more he combines attacks, making him much harder to avoid. On its own, it's really not a bad fight. The confined space means you're always on your toes, and Cunningham's probably one of the harder direct assault bosses for how numerous his attacks are and how much harder he is to avoid. The issue here is twofold. First, you're more or less doing the same thing all fight long. Avoid his attacks, lock on and shoot his craft, then shoot at him for a bit. Rinse and repeat. It doesn't overstay its welcome, but doesn't feel as exciting as the other fights. Plus, it's incredibly easy to catch Cunningham in a loop where he's powerless to do anything. And with how much better the mono e mono fights are in this game, I feel like Cunningham would have been much better served with a ground level fight at the silo, or at the very least giving him a ground level fight before the craft fight. The point is, Portable Ops' bosses were at their best when it was you alone with this overwhelming enemy in a large playing field. Again, his fight isn't bad, but compared to every other boss in this game, it just falls short. The others are boss fights I'm eager to jump back into. Cunningham's is just the obligation I gotta endure so I can get to the real show that is Gene's final boss fight. 
And as far as final bosses go, Jean might be one of my favorites. It's similar to Vulcan's fight from MGS3. It's you alone in this relatively small command center with Jean. You have limited cover and Jean's attacks are brutal. Jean has a wide variety of knife attacks, from basic slashes to a whole slew of different throwing knife attacks. He can also use his EMP to steadily drain your stamina until you manage to hit him. Like Noel, the act of just hitting Jean takes effort because frontal assaults don't cut it. He just dashes away from your attacks and counters with very hard to evade knife throws. In order to lay into Jean, you need to time your shots, hitting him when he's just about to attack, or just finish attacking, or taking advantage when he finishes his dash move, since it leaves him breathless for a few seconds, giving you a chance to deal serious damage with a shotgun or RPG. Jean's another example of a great direct combat boss. There's no gimmick or weapons restrictions, his attacks require effort to evade, there's a lot of them, and you can't really cheese his fight either. It's a direct showdown with the big bad who all game long has been built up as a near unstoppable force of nature and his final battle really lives up to that. And the final boss theme against Jean, good lord. This isn't one of the most beautifully climactic boss themes in all of Metal Gear, I don't know what is. So minus Cunningham, the bosses are all great. They give you a run for your money but genuinely feel fun to tango with, and each one utilizes the arena to complement the fights in unique and engaging ways. But really like MGS5, the biggest issue with Portable Ops' bosses is that there just aren't enough of them. For a game that runs as long as this one does, you needed way more unique encounters to spice up the often repetitive missions. Phantom Pain got away with it because almost each and every mission was a highly replayable romp that had enough structure and open-endedness to constantly feel unique from the last. With how many times you have to constantly fumble around to get to the next story mission, Portable Ops isn't quite as fortunate. There's just too long a stretch of constantly jumping back into the same levels to recruit soldiers or find documents before the game allows you to move on. And in all that time, nothing of note or intrigue is happening. Nothing that spices up the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It was either give this game more bosses, or just cut out all the fat and make a much shorter but ultimately far more entertaining video game. And if the money isn't there for the former, I always say go for the latter. And this being a spin-off game, I have to imagine it's the latter, especially being a spin-off game for the PSP. See, I think the real issue with this game overall is that Portable Ops shouldn't have been a portable game. With the scope of its story and the fact that it purports to be the missing link of Big Boss's tale, this was a game that needed to be on consoles, with a bigger budget for more varied content and a cleaner control scheme than it ultimately had. But like most of the spin-off titles, Portable Ops really wasn't much more than something meant to tide fans over to the next main entry, in this case MGS4. So like Ghost Babble, it won't have the budget of a game directed by Kojima. So if it's a question of having it as is or not having it at all, of course I'll take what we get because for all its faults, Portable Ops is a good game, one I've grown to appreciate more than I did when it first came out. It's ambitious in its scope. It was made with a very clear, confident vision. It knows how to bring about new elements while still being a decidedly Metal Gear experience. And if you can get past the hurdles of its clunky controls, tedious recruitment, and slog of campaign progression, there's plenty of fun to be had. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay can feel pretty satisfying, especially in combat. The bosses are mostly great, and I'd be incredibly remiss if I didn't mention the silo. Seriously, the silo is a perfect final level for this game. It adds some unique twists and turns, feeling decidedly more like classic Metal Gear. There's plenty of spaces to hide, and if situations go south, you can still fight your way through them, but doing so requires so much more effort, and the cost of screwing up is far more severe since it has no checkpoints. And while the recruitment itself is a slog, the act of getting to play as every single soldier in the game, bosses included, is really neat. It's almost like a playable version of theater mode, and honestly I wouldn't mind seeing a feature like that return, getting to actually play as the bosses or characters from previous games, all given their unique weapon or movesets. If those moves were as extensive as what we got in MGO2 and MGO3, then there'd be room for a lot of replay value just in the different ways each character plays in stealth and combat. So like I said, for all of its hurdles, there's a spark of brilliance in this game. But the fact ultimately remains, there are a lot of hurdles too. The clunky controls make it much harder to be fully immersed in these varied locations. The lack of enemy variety combined with the binary and padded nature of a lot of its missions meant that the game could feel really samey. For a shorter game that could be forgiven, if there were no lulls between story missions, everything would move at a pretty decent pace, with the uniqueness of each level making up for the lack of enemy variety and making the wait between bosses feel far shorter. 
As is, it's a good game with the potential to be a great game whose fun is constantly hampered by the hardware limitations and iffy design choices. In creating a new foundation for a new kind of Metal Gear experience, shifting away from tactical espionage stealth to tactical stealth operations, yeah, there's bound to be tons of trial and error, which we saw streamlined with Peace Walker and perfected with Phantom Pain. None of that would be possible without Portable Ops, and despite its many flaws, it's a game I ultimately enjoyed playing. Unfortunately, unlike Peace Walker and especially Phantom Pain, it's also not a game I'm in any hurry to jump back into anytime soon. Which means now it's time to get into the writing and quite possibly Snake's Pants. The premise is, six years after the events of MGS3, Naked Snake, aka Young Big Boss, has been captured by a rogue faction of Fox, Snake's former agency, who are now stirring up a revolution in the San Geronimo Peninsula. And in order to prove both his and Major Zero's innocence, Snake has to take down the Renegades and their leader, the enigmatic Gene. However, Gene has an army, so Snake has to raise his own army to beat Gene and his former comrades. With the help of a young Roy Campbell, a young psychic girl named Elise, and arguably Snake's strongest ally yet, Truck. As far as storylines go, Portable Ops may borrow heavily from the skeleton of MGS1, but unlike MGS1, it's one of the most refreshingly straightforward plots in the entire series. There are twists and turns, betrayals, and deeper webs being woven, but at its core, this is about how Naked Snake went from solo operator to supreme mercenary commander, pitting his army against Jeans and seeing who comes out on top. Despite having Metal Gear Solid in the title, this game wasn't actually written or directed by Hideo Kojimbo. Instead, it was directed by Masahiro Yamamoto and written by Gakuto Makumo. As such, there's always talk as to whether or not this game is technically canon. Even though this game does show how Big Boss began his stint as Mercenary Jesus, if you went from MGS3 to Peace Walker, nothing would really be lost. How did Snake garner an army? Who cares? It's been 10 years and the dude's THE legend. It's not that hard to imagine younger recruits or older Kiefer medics clamoring to serve under a man like that. That being said, whether it is or isn't canon doesn't matter. It could absolutely have happened and nothing is gained or lost if it did. The only question that ever matters with any of these canonical games or spin-offs shouldn't be about its place in the lore, but rather how it holds up on its own. So how does Portable Ops hold up on its own? Well, to be honest, like an MGS game. That is to say, some standout characters, some really good ideas, some truly excellent moments, and a collective whole that never lives up to the sum of its parts. I love the core premise of Snake starting from scratch and having to build an army up, with a motive that on the surface is just about stopping the bad guy, but steadily blossoms into something deeper. And I always love the concept of going up against your former comrades, because I love when enemies have an actual history with one another. But as I find myself always saying with these games, there's idea and then there's execution, and the execution to the story feels too rushed and often underbaked to be fully engrossing. It's not without its moments, and some of those moments are the finest in the series, but Portable Ops doesn't feel like it has the time needed for its great ideas to breathe. As a result, I'm always on the verge of being drawn in, as opposed to being fully invested. First, let's talk about Snake himself, because to me, the way Snake is written in this game is a huge step up from MGS3. In Snake Eater, Snake is essentially an information sponge. He stands around and gets talked at, doesn't have any interesting dialogue with the villains except Ocelot. I see what you were trying to do, but testing a technique you've only heard about in the middle of battle wasn't very smart. You were asking to have your gun jam on you. Besides, I don't think you're cut out for an automatic in the first place. He literally only has one line of dialogue with Volgan and the entire Cobra unit. Are you one of the Cobras? What is the Philosopher's legacy? But here, Snake not only engages with his enemies and other characters, but there's genuine substance to what he's saying. Something often very lacking in the hero-villain dynamic of the MGS series. And it isn't just a line or two either. It's consistent throughout the game. Honestly, canon or not, when I think of Big Boss, it's Portable Ops and Peace Walker that do him the most justice, and this is exactly why. Because both games not only serve to humanize and characterize him better than MGS3 did, they actually make the things he has to say feel meaningful. Snake's ideologies are more solidified now than in MGS3. He hasn't gone full mercenary Jesus yet, but he's starting to understand what he wants and what soldiers like him need, or at least think they need. Of course, a hero's journey is only as strong as a villain pushing them to the brink. And for this journey, we have Gene, the superhuman commander of Fox and what might be a near-perfect Metal Gear villain. Gene's not only very charismatic, but he has this eerily calm, constantly calculating demeanor, where at no point does it ever feel like he isn't in complete control of the situation at all times. 
See, that's one thing MGS villains have always struggled with. They're constantly being undermined and manipulated, either by Ocelot or they're getting screwed by renegade writers aiming to sabotage their own stories right at the home stretch, which in turn renders them far less effective as villains, because it's hard to view an antagonist as effective if they're constantly failing. Gene doesn't have that problem. At all times, he is portrayed as the most intelligent and most dangerous person in any given scene. Even when those around him have their own agendas, Gene is never caught off guard. Their schemes are utterly insignificant to him and don't threaten his plans. This is a villain whose mind is one of his greatest strengths. But for as sharp as his mind may be, those endless daggers are every bit as sharp. His superhuman speed mixed with his near hypnotic voice make him that much scarier when we see what Gene himself can do or make others do to themselves. And it isn't just his abilities that make him so dangerous, it's his cunning, the way he can read everyone around him, and the seeming disdain he has for humanity, to the point where he doesn't even seem to regard himself as human anymore, being a byproduct of the top secret experiment called the Successor Project. Basically a project to create the perfect battlefield commander, which reiterates what makes him the best foil for Snake. The latter is a man who has to rely on his character, his legend, and his sheer will to win over the hearts of men he would put his life on the line for, whereas Gene can effortlessly worm his way into a man's heart, make him feel valued, and manipulate them into giving up their meaningless lives for him. And that's one thing Portable Ops does quite well. Throughout multiple scenes, it constantly highlights the differences between these two commanders. The meaning of justice can change from one day to the next. A professional soldier never brings justice into the mission. The only ones who need a reason to fight are the ones who fight for a living. That's what my mentor told me. Politics are fickle. They change with the times. So long as we remain loyal to our countries, soldiers like us need nothing to believe in. She died out of loyalty. Not to justice. Not to her country. To herself. For the mission. Prove your loyalty as a soldier. That's what the boss told me. I still don't know what she meant. Prove your loyalty. Not to justice. Not to your country. But to yourself. Whereas Jean, well, this scene speaks for itself. One of my men is standing amongst you right now. His instructions are to kill you for your betrayal. He's lying! Don't listen to him! He's gonna kill us! He's going to kill us! Hey! Get a hold of yourself! Snap out of it! Your enemy is standing right beside you. Is it you? Or perhaps you? This planet is like a giant bomb. See how easily it blows itself to bits with a single nuclear warhead. Or rather, a single bullet. <laughs> there he is. It's the enemy. Who's shooting? Who's shooting? The bastard shot him. <laughs> this is a true Metal Gear villain done right. He's a unique and memorable character played to perfection by the legendary voice actor Steve Bloom in one of my personal favorite performances of his. His abilities make him a force to be reckoned with, emphasized by how difficult his final boss fight is. He isn't outsmarted, manipulated, beaten by deus ex machina, or bested by arrogance. He's the first MGS villain that a protagonist just has to straight up overcome, and he feels like it too. So much so that Gene was the first villain to nearly succeed in his mission, to launch Metal Gear Sputnik at the Pentagon, wiping out the philosophers and creating a new world order. Which is part of the great contrast between these two foes. Gene's true endgame is to create a nation for soldiers called Army's Heaven, where the strong thrive, shaping the world by intervening in conflicts where they can tilt the odds towards whatever side they favor. To Gene, the idea of nations being built on petty politics and pseudo-nationalism is but a hollow foundation, all too easily toppled. With the philosophers and the boss failed, Gene believes he'll succeed, making the world whole again by decimating the old guard. Gene's plans are devastating, depraved, and because he's so effective at what he does, could work, plunging the world into chaos while he and his elites reap the rewards from the shadows. He wants to give soldiers a purpose by using them as his tools, because to him, that's all they are, mindless weapons in need of a cunning gunman to point them at the directions he desires. 
Whereas Snake wants soldiers to find that purpose for themselves, fighting for causes they actually believe in, instead of being told what to believe by a tyrant like Gene or politicians looking to colonize land or siphon resources. Hence, outer heaven, outside of Gene's heaven, and outside of the conventional support our troops so long as it's convenient nonsense we see far too much of. One of the most consistent themes throughout the series has always been purpose, deciding for yourself what your place in life is, how you want to live, in game as a soldier, in life as a person. And one of the best parts of Portal Bops' story is having that theme resonate so strongly between the hero and villain. Big Boss, like Snake, wants people to find their own lot in life, to fight for themselves and what they feel is right. Unlike Snake, however, that purpose is seemingly always through war and is kind of the first seed being planted that would eventually see Big Boss grow into the warmonger we know and loathe. It's a perfect contrast that reinforces why Gene is such an amazing villain, and why the central theme of Portable Ops is such a strong one. It's just a shame that next to none of the characters around Gene really live up to him and his master plan, because minus Gene and Snake, I didn't care about a single character in this game or their struggles. And a big part of why is because we don't spend enough time with each character to get invested, or the characters feel superfluous and kind of boring. Snake's supporting cast consists of Campbell, a psychic girl named Elisa, and a random Red Army soldier named Jonathan because we don't have enough characters in this series named John, do we? Campbell could have been literally any other character and it wouldn't have made a difference. There's no real driving goal the way Cause wanted to build MSF up, or how Otacon wanted to redeem his family name because of his awful, awful, awful father. Campbell's personality here is incredibly wooden, with his most defining trait being that he's inappropriate around underage girls voiced by Tara Strong, nor is he all that fun to watch either. There's no scenes of chemistry building between him and Snake, the way we got with Kaz or Otacon. He's not funny or all that likable, he's just some dude. See, one of the reasons I actually really liked Peace Walker's plot and pacing was because, for as bad as his villains were, it took the time to make sure you got to know the lead characters. Snake and Otacon have plenty of scenes together, where both not only get to expand upon their motives and ideologies, but genuinely have fun or sincere moments that make them feel human and likable. With a game as short as Portable Ops, no one is afforded that same luxury. Everything is too blunt and businessy with Campbell to matter, and the rest of the gang doesn't fare much better. I thought long and hard about the whole Elisa and Ursula thing, how the twin sisters are just one person, and for the life of me, I can't recall what actual purpose that twist served, or for that matter, what purpose Elisa served to the plot as a whole. She's basically there to program Null, more on him shortly, and as Ursula, she's used to control Diet Metal Gear here. When she has her big awakening, she forces Jean to launch from the control room, which literally could have just been where things went from the start. Then she dies immediately after. What purpose did she serve? Or more importantly, was she at least interesting to watch in action? Personally, I didn't think so. The split personality thing didn't really come up until her boss fight in Roxa, and I wasn't so attached to Elisa that I cared that I was fighting her. She lays out one warning about her other side, and spells out a tepid premonition about Les Enfants Terribles that goes absolutely nowhere. The potential intrigue comes through her backstory and how Nukes messed her up, and how Jean saved her, but none of that is ever explored. As Elisa, she never has any scenes with Jean except when he shanks her. See, again, it comes back to there just being not enough screen time to make her interesting or endearing. I don't care about Elisa, and Ursula only appears in four cutscenes, so I care even less when she has her big melodramatic death. That's honestly the recurring theme throughout the entire game. I don't care about anyone because I'm not given enough time to feel like I should care. And unfortunately, the same kind of applies to Jean's far more colorful and more interesting henchmen as well. Python's a bundle of fun, played to hammy perfection by Dwight Schultz. He looks like Pinhead, he sounds like a cartoon character, he's got one of the coolest boss teams in the series, and he's got personality to spare. Better yet, he's a rogue agent who has a history with Snake and a tragic goal driving him. All the check marks knocked off for a truly great MGS boss character. But you know what else he has? Three cutscenes in the entire game. And whether you recruit him or not, he's never so much as mentioned again. He's an incredibly memorable, fleshed out character, with far more color than most of the cast, but he's got as much screen time as the evil beehive from Snake Eater. Null, aka Young Grey Fox, aka MGS Winter Soldier, fares better in terms of screen time. He's got about five cutscenes in the game, and things are slightly more personal for Snake. As Frank Yeager, he was a child soldier whom Snake defeated and saved by bringing to a rehab facility, unaware that it was owned by the philosophers who turned Frankie J here into angsty ninja boy and Noel's programming to just be the perfect soldier clashes violently with his memories of the man who beat and saved him, the same man who just won't die. There was a very interesting subplot here, 
something that was far more compelling than a lot of the story beats of the game up to that point. But then Snake just beats Null and that's it. No seeds planted for these two teaming up 20 years later, no real sit-downs exploring Null's tragic past, and all the stuff Gene was making him do as his puppet soldier, and worse yet, cut Null out of the game completely and nothing changes. See, one of the other issues with Portable Ops is very few of the characters actually serve as the larger story. Most of their arcs exist within a vacuum, and if removed from the game, nothing is compromised. For as fleshed out as the villains may be, they're ultimately little more than another Cobra unit, and that would be fine, except Python and Null are genuinely interesting characters, and I'd rather spend more time with them than I would most of the other characters in this game. Which fittingly brings us to Cunningham, a big bad brute who starts off on a very high and interesting note, and becomes progressively less interesting the more he turns up. See, Cunningham's got the same issue as Volgan, in that they're both idiots. He's big and intimidating, but he's constantly pursuing answers that we already know Snake doesn't have. Cunningham plays the role of secret traitor for the game, where he's actually a government operative conspiring against Gene, using him to do the Pentagon's bidding. But outside of the ending, he's not actively sabotaging Gene's efforts or attempting to. He's not covertly aiding Snake. He's mainly focused on securing the Philosopher's legacy and making sure the Pentagon's master plan goes off, only to crash and burn immediately and literally after his boss fight. See, it makes a character less interesting when you, the viewer, are two steps ahead of them. And in the case of a villain, substantially less threatening and less credible. Tension building comes two different ways. Either you, the viewer, know there's a bomb under the table before the characters, which builds the tension, or one of the characters knows there's a bomb before you, the viewer, does, and they aren't showing their hand, keeping you engaged by keeping you guessing. Cunningham does neither. We're ahead of him because we already know Snake doesn't have the legacy and isn't in league with anybody but the usual suspects. We also know he's shady because he keeps letting slip that he's not on the up and up. And once he has his big reveal, he dies almost immediately after, and nothing can be done with the information we've just learned about him. For a guy with cunning in his name, Cunningham is anything but. And I think what's frustrating is the fact that the pieces are there for not only a really great character, but one that kind of plays exactly into the very thing Snake and Gene are fighting to prevent. Snake and Gene clash ideologically, but they both agree on one thing. Soldiers shouldn't be tools to nameless suits who use them constantly and throw them aside despite the scars and sacrifices. Cunningham's a perfect example of just that. He's a combat vet who lost his leg in battle and was shuffled off to a desk job like a nobody when he returned home. He's bitter and angry and part of his motivation is revenge, and yet in spite of that, Cunningham is still the Pentagon's lapdog, doing their bidding in the hopes that this time he'll get the recognition he deserves, maybe even a position of power. It's almost enough to make you feel sorry for him, knowing he's forever somebody's tool, sacrificing himself for a reward that was never going to come. The pieces were all there, but they just never materialized. And that's kind of enigmatic of the overall issue with Portable Ops' story. Its skeleton is strong, some of the characters are even stronger, and others have the potential to be great, but due to a lack of screen time, those themes are never explored in a way that genuinely feels compelling. The characters don't get the time they deserve to really pluck at your nerves and feel something for them. I like everything that's going on, but it all feels like a lot of been there, done that, because without that strong characterization, a lot of these stories would feel that way. I mean, at their core, every Metal Gear story boils down to stopping colorful bad guys from using some kind of robot dinosaur to unleash nuclear Armageddon for their own personal gain. It's always what's going on underneath that makes or breaks each story. Portable Ops has plenty beneath the surface, particularly the theme of purpose and what it truly means to be a soldier. It just doesn't have enough meat there to really chew on. Not in exploring the actual commander side of Snake, spending more time with the more genuinely interesting characters in the game, or even exploring the only real tie this game has to MGS4, or at least a tie it could have had, establishing Zero's fallout with Snake. Snake's journey starts off with him needing to clear both his and Major Zero's name, with Paramedic and Sigan also passively involved. But that kind of falls by the wayside as the story progresses, and I feel like that was a misstep. Like, forget Campbell and Elisa, having Zero back as the main support with Sigan and Paramedic and showing them finally starting to splinter from one another as they're forced to go up against their own comrades could have added a genuinely interesting angle to the plot. That the enemy faction is Fox doesn't even factor into the larger story in any meaningful way. There's no real conflict in going up against your former comrades. In fact, minus Python and Null, Snake doesn't even have any personal connection to any of his adversaries. And plenty could have been done with that. Not just for Snake, but Zero too. These are his men after all, and going up against them could have shown Snake and Zero growing more desperate, and in that desperation, seeing the real ideological differences between both men. For as much as Portable Ops paraded that missing link tagline pre-release, it really could have been, 
and arguably should have been. Which reiterates what I've been saying, this game should not have been a throwaway portable spin-off. The themes are genuinely interesting, most of the characters memorable, and the beginning of Snake's transformation is subtle but well established. Even the desire to pass his twisted worldview onto other soldiers, potentially yearning for a purpose they can't quite pinpoint. We even see it in a pretty great payoff by the end, where Snake's actions and resolve inspire his men to fighting alongside him to the ends of the earth. That's all great stuff. But there's so few cutscenes in the game to really do any of that justice. So what you're left with is a serviceable story with high stakes, some great characters, a near perfect main villain, some really great ideas, and truly unforgettable moments. But the collective whole that never lets any of it stew enough. It goes through the motions fairly smoothly and mostly never stumbles along the way, but there just isn't enough of it. Which is a shame because for as different as the game's presentation may be, it's still top notch. I love stylistic graphic novel artwork, and Ashley Woods' moving novel cutscenes all look great. The voice acting across the board is solid, with Steve Bloom as the absolute MVP and the soundtrack. This game was the final time Norihiko Hibino was the lead composer behind a Metal Gear game. He still worked on later entries, but under new leads, and if this was his last hurrah, then what a note to go out on because I swear, this game is his magnum opus. There's also some fun one and done side stories where you reconnect with characters from MGS3. Like learning Volgan's boy toy Major Rykov got taken down a peg by his men once Volgan was man on fired from life. And I also have to give a shout out to the dialogue in this game. While I have my issues with the story's sparsity, what made the cutscenes and character interactions work so well is just how much more human they feel than in MGS3. Snake engages with every single character around him in far more meaningful fashion, and there's a much more naturalistic feel to the dialogue as well. There's tons of the faux philosopher moments, but they never drag on or feel unearned, especially from someone as pretentious and venomous as Gene. So I guess the best way I could describe Portable Ops' writing and story is that it goes down smooth but doesn't fill you up. I ultimately enjoyed my time with Portable Ops and was glad to revisit it, but I was left wanting so much more than this game could ultimately give me. But that being said, what I think Portable Ops nails is the feeling of Metal Gear Solid. Light though the cutscenes may be, everything about this journey feels like a conventional MGS storyline, and at times I'd argue a little stronger, at least in terms of dialogue and the effectiveness of its main villain. And really, what Portable Ops demonstrates above all else is that yes, Metal Gear can absolutely exist without Kojima's involvement. Maybe not MGS itself, but Metal Gear games in general. Portable Ops shows that with the right team, you can create a rock-solid journey that genuinely scratches that Metal Gear itch that no other games can except Death Stranding and its sequel. Because this game gets what makes MGS's stories work. It has something meaningful to say has some really well-rounded and colorful characters, a phenomenal main villain, and portrays Snake in a way that feels like a genuine evolution of the younger grizzled man we met in Snake Eater. Just give folks like these more room to let their stories and their characters breathe, and you're golden. And maybe don't make your main supporting character a potential child predator. In the end, I walked away appreciating Port of Lops a lot more than I did when I first played it 17 years ago. It laid down a foundation that later Big Boss era games would master, but managed to have that great middle ground of open mission design and linear MGS campaign. It was ambitious to a fault, trying to do way too much with the gameplay than the PSP could ever comfortably deliver, while not doing nearly enough with the actual missions themselves. But the fact that it still works and can be fun to play at times when you get a handle of the busy control scheme is quite an accomplishment. Where Portable Ops floundered hardest was its recruitment system, the pacing of its campaign, and the overall lack of flair in its missions. 
ditching the fat, providing some more objective-based missions, or just having more missions and levels like the silo mission would have worked wonders. A stronger inventory management system would have helped the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay feel so much less limiting. Given that MGS is a series renowned for letting you play around with all its gear, and Portable Ops limits you to only four items per unit. The boss fights were easily the biggest highlight of the campaign, but there were too few of them spread too far out, and not all of them were bangers. As a story, everything works, and at times the writing shines beautifully. But much like the gameplay, the cutscenes are too few in between, and most of the main supporting characters and villains don't get enough screen time. To the point where at times the game's story feels a bit more boilerplate than it should, because every MGS storyline on its own is fairly boilerplate. It's the characters and conspiracies beneath the surface that always make or break these tales, and Portable Ops just doesn't do enough with either or. Portable Ops is a game in a strange place. It was only ever meant to be a spin-off game that would tie people over until MGS4, not a mainline entry. And if the question is would I rather have what we got or nothing at all, then I'll take what we got easily. But what we got deserved to be more than a spin-off game that is largely ignored by the canon. The context behind the story, the characters involved, the transition for Big Boss. If this game was going to be marketed as the missing link, then it should have truly been the missing link. It adds more context to Big Boss's story and descent into villainy, but it's not so deep that it's essential to getting the overall arc. You could go straight from MGS3 to Peace Walker and still have no issues figuring out how Snake went from Delusion Secret Agent to Mercenary Commander. On its own, the story is fine and worth experiencing for the moments where it shines like anytime Gene is on screen. But it's all just too minimal to be genuinely satisfied with as one tends to be with the rest of the series, even the other spin-off games. I enjoyed my time with Portable Ops, but I didn't love my time with it. The clunky controls, tedious mission pacing, lack of standout missions like the silo mission, and limited inventory keep preventing me from being fully into it. But it laid the foundation for games I actually did quite love, and what's here is ultimately rock solid and definitely worth playing on emulator if you haven't already. And so my final rating for Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops is a 7 out of 10. And quite honestly, now that Phantom Pain is coming gone, when the next original Metal Gear game beyond MGS Delta comes about, I would love to see Portable Ops' campaign structure, but with levels and missions more akin to MGS 5, where you have these varied locations like in Portable Ops, but the scope is more akin to Camp Omega, OKB Zero, Lufwa Valley, things like that. I wouldn't even mind seeing Portable Ops' squadron-based gameplay return, now that games like Peace Walker and Phantom Pain have streamlined it to perfection. And if we saw more bosses like Python, Null, and Gene come about, but with some added bells and whistles, I'm definitely not going to complain and can't imagine you would either. Portable Ops may be rough around the edges, but I do genuinely think it's earned the solid in its title. Because while skimpy, it does still feel like a proper MGS game, and it's just an overall solid experience. How do you feel about Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops? Were you able to get past the busy controls? Was it a game you played for its single player or its online components? What are some elements from Portable Ops that you'd like to see return in future entries? And who else misses the random duck toy? Whatever your thoughts, whether you agreed or disagreed, let me know in the comments. If you like this review, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to a PC algorithm. Anyway, thanks for watching. Also, say what you will about Portable Ops. At least it gave Steve Bloom's villain a way better boss fight than Peace Walker did. Big Boss!